Well, this is the final week of this conversation we are having in the month of September about serving versus consumerism. Servants, not consumers. And we've said week after week, we've acknowledged that consumerism is the religion of our day. It's everywhere. And so because of that, it's in us. To one degree or another, consumerism has invaded our hearts, our minds, our souls, and we live through its tenets, its beliefs in our real lives. It, it's just unavoidable that it's there and that there is a journey of moving intentionally from that towards what Jesus teaches, which is servanthood. He says, unless a seed falls in the ground and dies, it doesn't bear any fruit. That there's something about that that is the key to life with a capital L. And Jesus says unashamedly, he says without any equivocation, you lay down your life, you find it. If you try to protect your life, you lose it. There is something about selfless generosity in the power of his spirit that is life as it was meant to be lived and you will never be more alive. But that is completely right side up from the upside down world of consumerism that we live in. And it is tough to trust that. It is tough to say, yeah, it is also tough to not suspect that somebody who is speaking about that doesn't have an ulterior motive. Like trying to fill rotas. Or make sure a children's ministry has workers for a given Sunday morning. And so we said unashamedly that that will not be an issue for us. Last week we put out this commitment. The three commitments. First of all, no one will be asked to serve in a role longer than 12 months without an interview or a chat and an offer to stop. So you sign up, you're not going to get stuck there because after a year of serving in that role, you're going to get the opportunity to say, you know what, I need a break. The second commitment is even if you say, no, I'm okay, I want to keep going. After two years, we will ask you to take a break because we realize that you're going to probably need to have a season where you can do some other stuff, explore some other giftings and callings in your life. And that's healthy. And the third commitment, which I quoted earlier this morning, is that if we do not have the team, we will not offer the program. Now, you can feel safe to learn how to serve by getting involved in serving here at CV. That's why I put those up there. I put those up there because I want you to know that you're safe, that you're not going to be manipulated, that there isn't ulterior motives, that church does not matter more than you. Okay. Serving is about Jesus. It's about following Jesus into life with a capital L. And when we serve in a family like this, it is an opportunity to grow and learn and be stretched and develop our serving muscle. It is not a dead end of religious obligation. Okay. So I'm going to pass this around. This is a Sunday morning serving. There are three or four serving teams Every Sunday morning that makes things happen, kids is one. The kids team sign up is at that table at the back. There is also hospitality. There is set up and tear down. There is greeting. And as Elizabeth said, there's a worship team. These are all volunteer roles. These are all roles that people give out of their own selfless desire to serve. Now, listen, you don't always feel like it. And that's part of the point. Because learning how to serve in a consumer society takes intentionality. So, I'm just going to pass this around. And for those of you, that will hopefully make its way around the whole room this morning. If, uh, if you are not currently serving, if you are not currently serving, that's important. Maybe jot your name down. We'll get in touch with you and find a place where you can get involved. Is that cool? You with me? Have I lost you? You see, guys, here's the thing. When you, when you have 
jobs to do, when there's stuff that needs to get done and serving is part of it, very often as a leader, there's a temptation to try to control and try to pressurize people. And that's why many of you are leery, because you've experienced that. You've been manipulated. You've been um, pressured into this. And that's not the heart of New Testament servant. I read this quote this week. It's next to my desk. And you know how stuff's there and you just forget it's there? And then all of a sudden you read it and you read it like, oh, wow, I read that for the first time. But no, it's been there for years and you read it years ago and put it by your desk because you liked it so much. Richard Foster says, we need habitual reminders that the Christian life comes not by gritting teeth, but by falling in love. So powerful. That's how this is meant to work. Now, for some of you, you're like, yeah, whatever, Jim, that's, that's idealistic. Can I just say this? This is an idealistic church. We will not let cynicism rule. We will not behave because cynicism says that won't work in the real world. Doesn't mean we'll be clueless. We won't be naive, but we will stay idealistic. And I want to be a part of a movement of people who step out selflessly, generously. Why? Because they're in love with Jesus. And Jesus is inviting them into a journey of selflessness and generosity. Because that's what he did and wants to do through us. Because we're in love with Jesus. That's the thing, guys. Do you know that Jesus? Do you know a Jesus that would warrant inconveniencing your consumer lifestyle? Don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. Think about that. Do you know a Jesus who is awesome enough to warrant you inconveniencing your consumer lifestyle and choosing generosity and selflessness in pursuit of him? We exist so that people can meet that Jesus. Jesus. So, let's talk a little bit about consumerism. This is from a book called The Culture of Narcissism. Has anyone heard of that book? I recommend it to you. It's, it's a little old now, but it's absolutely powerful. And the author says this. We have retreated to purely personal preoccupations. This is what consumerism does for us. We get a bit jaded, and then consumerism and its immediacy becomes very attractive to us. So we turn to purely personal preoccupations. Having no hope of improving our lives in any of the ways that matter, we have convinced ourselves that what matters is self-fulfillment. Not realizing that consumerism never offers self-fulfillment. That only servanthood and life following Jesus is self-fulfilling. Okay? Getting in touch with our feelings, eating health food, taking lessons in ballet, immersing themselves in the wisdom of the East, jogging, harmless in themselves. Did you hear that? I'm not criticizing jogging, right? I'm not criticizing ballet, but in, it is in some ways and forms a part, a pursuit, elevated to a program and wrapped in rhetoric that signifies a retreat and a repudiation. To live for the moment is the prevailing passion. To live for yourself. This is the religion of our day. This is what we live in. It's in the air around us. Does anyone have an amen for me? Is this not true? Do we not experience this everywhere? They... Uh, they found some statistics here, and they're kind of mind-blowing. 60% of successful professionals are experiencing some degree of depression. These are highly successful people. 48% of the top executives state that their lives 
are meaningless or empty. Top executives. You know what that means? That means they've chased the ambition path and won. They've climbed the ambition ladder and succeeded. They're top executives. They're successful people. But they find that 48% of those, when they think about their life, they use the word meaningless or empty to describe their life. That's shocking. And the third quote uh, stat here is this. Although GDP has risen explosively since 1975, the index of social health is 52% lower than it was in 1973. And what's that, what that means is this. All of the wealth, all of the stuff, all of the consumer goods... The stuff that consumerism says will give you self-fulfillment has been poured out in unbelievable amounts since 1975, right? All of the consumer options have gone boom. But you know what? Well-being has halved. Consumerism is a lie. We have never had more stuff. We have never had more wealth. We have never had more options. And we have never been more miserable. Consumerism is a lie. Consumerism is empty. Consumerism does not deliver on the promise. That's the truth. This is why Jesus comes to you and says, You're going down the wrong road. Follow me. Unless a seed falls in the ground. There's no fruit. I want to talk about one truth this morning, okay? And the truth is this. Why should we serve? Why should we choose the path of servanthood over consumerism? And the reason is simple. It's an honor. When we use that language to describe serving... When someone serves their guts out and you come up to them and you go, thank you for doing that. And they turn to you and from the depths of their authentic heart say, no, 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 you don't have to say thanks. It's an honor to be able to do this. Then we will have understood what Jesus is trying to teach us about life. It is an honor. What is the good life? The life of serving. Now, one of the first, um, not one of the first, but one of the most powerful examples I ever had of this ethos was when I started hanging around some of the people at Trent Vineyard up in Nottingham. That's a big, this is a big bit of language around serving at Trent. It's an honor. And they tell stories all the time about people who serve and how it's an honor. And I remember Debbie Wright she and her husband, John, were, were the senior pastors that planted the church, still lead the church. And telling stories about the first few years of Trent Vineyard's existence. It's, over, it's like a few thousand people now, but back then it was a few dozen people. And they were doing church in a venue that was a bit dodgy. Maybe a little bit like this. And, and the toilet stopped working one Sunday morning. All right? Oh! Inconvenience. I don't even know if that's consumerism. That's like necessityism. So they made a commitment that all of the adults would cross their legs and hold it. No adults would be able to use the loo in the morning. But the kids, you can't help it with the kids, can you? So Debbie Wright tells the story about this morning where when the kids needed to go to the loo, they would take them and... and of course, it's simple when it's number one, but what about when it's number two? And Debbie Wright tells the story of how thrilled and ecstatic she was because she volunteered to be part, senior pastor volunteered to be part of the team that scooped up the little kitty turds and carried them outside of the building somewhere where they could be disposed of. And she's, she's telling the story about how she was walking across the back of the sanctuary with a scooper full of a few little baby turds. 
to go through and how thrilled she was to be able to play this role and understand and show and embody what Jesus is calling us to as a church. That serving is where life is found. That story's never gone out of my head. And every once in a while, I really wish something radical would happen so that we can model that here. Um, you know, thankfully the toilets still work. So do what you got to do. But you see, the understanding that serving is an honor is a perspective switch that is huge to self fulfillment. Now, we've looked at these two verses in the past few weeks, and so I just want to quickly touch on them because as Jesus teaches about servanthood, he's constantly teaching also that it's an honor, that it's honored in his kingdom, the role of servant. And so he's, there's this story we see in uh, John chapter 13. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, which was the ultimate act of servanthood in this day and age, it was the lowest of the low that washed the feet of the house guests, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This begins with the leaders on down. For I give you, gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than their master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You are blessed if you do them. You are blessed. That word has lost its content. But to live a blessed life. Is a really good thing. The second verse is from John chapter 12. Very truly I tell you. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed. But if it dies. It produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world. Will keep it for eternal life. Now and then. Whoever serves me. Must follow me. And where I am. My servant also will be. And then he closes with this. My father will honor the one who serves me. The path of servanthood is the path of blessing. It's the the path of honor. It's constantly woven in to Jesus' teachings. Let me just blast you through a few quick verses So you can see this lived out in other people's lives. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What's he talking about there? He's talking about laying his life down for the people around him. He's talking about serving. He's talking about serving. And he says this, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then jump down to verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do, laying your life down. For as I have often told you before and now, tell you even again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. There's no better way to describe the religion of consumerism. This path is broken. We also see this in Philippians 2, the chapter before that. He says, but even I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I rejoice and share my joy with you all. The life that's given out is a life that he rejoices to be able to give. Why? Because he understands what Jesus says about the life that is blessed, the life that is honored. 
Let's look at these quick ones. This is from Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Where, where are you putting your investment? You know what I mean? It's like as we invest in the consumerism of this age, we're making a bet that actually the fulfillment is found in that account. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I want you to invest in this account over here. I want you to serve the Lord Christ, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Where's the payoff in your world? Is it in your career advancement? Is it in your marriage and the finding of a a, a spouse? Is it in stuff? Where is the payoff? Paul says very clear to the church at Colossae, the payoff is in Christ. In Proverbs, it says this, a person's pride will bring them low, but a humble spirit obtains honor. The spirit of the servant. Second Corinthians, Paul writes this. He says, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, it's, it's the right side up life that we're being given here from Christ. Do you get this, guys? This is flipping everything about what this world teaches us and where to find fulfillment. James 4.10 says this, Humble, meaning reduce in rank yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. It means lift you up on high, raise to honor. And finally, Philippians chapter 1. For you have been given the privilege of serving Christ, not only by believing in him, but also by suffering for him. The privilege of suffering for him. Does that twist your knot at all? The privilege of suffering for him. You see, when that starts to make sense, then you're starting to get it. Now you can take part with me in the battle. It is the same battle you saw me fighting in the past. And as you hear, the one I am fighting still. That's the Christian life. Unless a seed falls in the ground and dies, there's no fruit. So, I'm just going to give you this one, okay? Why is it an honor? Let me just give you, I'll just quickly highlight this. The first thing is this. I believe that God chooses to work through his people. It's an honor. He doesn't have to, he chooses. The fact that God chooses to work through people is absurd, actually. It's absurd. When you get to pray for somebody and God comforts them as you have your hand on their shoulder and you're praying for peace and comfort for them. He didn't need you. Yeah, he doesn't need the church. We're constantly fouling it up. In fact, it would probably be a lot more efficient if he just went with angels. You know what I mean? But he said, no, I want a family. I want to raise kids. I don't want to just get the job done. You get it? He wants you to know him. And it's because of that that he chooses to work through us. It's for us. Not because he needs us. It is an honor. And the second one is this. The task we are called to participate in. The servanthood we are called to offer. Is the hope of the world. And that's an honor. I mean to be able to help someone know. That the creator of the universe 
thinks they're amazing. To be able to stand back there and hand someone a cup of coffee who's just walked into church and is completely intimidated because they, they, church isn't their habit. And they're like, oh my gosh, what's this going to be like? And to chat to them about life and to show them the dignity they deserve. To smile. You are communicating eternal realities to that person. What a privilege. You see, God, the knowledge of God, the realization that he loves people is the hope of the world. And you get to be the carrier of that amazing message. It's the hope of the world and you get to carry it. What an honor. What an honor. But the main one I want to give some time to is this one. It is the genuine path to greatness. Servanthood is the genuine path to greatness. So let's look at this verse, okay? If you've got a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10. I've been giving you a lot of scripture this morning. I realize that. And you're like, wait, Jim, where's the stories? Where's all this? They're, don't worry, they're coming. But the thing is this. I want you to know this isn't me. I want you to know that this is Jesus. I care a lot more about what Jesus thinks than I do what I think. Okay, so I want you to understand that this is deeply scriptural. This is the heart of the New Testament. This is not an agenda. In Mark chapter 10, we get this story of Jesus and his disciples. And it is so apropos of my experience of church over the years. And my experience of my own heart. Start in verse 35 of Mark chapter 10. Then James and John, two of the disciples, the sons of Zebedee, their nickname were sons of thunder. So they weren't shrinking violets, all right? Came to him and said, teacher or rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. There you go. Consumer Christianity. Jesus as slot machine. Right? Jesus as vending machine. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. This is consumer Christianity. And I love Jesus goes with it. He says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they reply, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, what they are asking is to be the two most honored individuals in the new kingdom of God. They are asking to be the most powerful humans at Jesus' right and left hand. They are looking for glory. They are looking for position. They are looking for honor. They are looking for reputation and ambition. Okay? This is where life's found. Position. And Jesus... You know, we've been following you. We've been doing a good job. We think we're your guys. Put us in those posts, please. You don't know what you are asking. Why? Because they're upside down. They're asking an upside down question. And the right side up kingdom comes at it totally differently. You see, the brash person, the pushy person, the, the, the person whose eye is on the prize and who grabs for the brass ring gets that in a consumer society. But in the kingdom of God, it works totally differently. It's flipped. And this is what Jesus says. He says, can you drink the cup I drink or be bat baptized with the bapti baptism I am baptized with? What he's saying is that glory comes through suffering for my kingdom, for my people. It, it comes with laying down my life, laying down my privileges, laying down everything that I'm entitled to for others. And then glory is bestowed by the Father. Can you drink the cup? You know what the cup he's talking about is? He's about to be crucified. He's about to be hung on a cross. And to die. Slowly. Agonizingly. 
He's saying, can you walk the path of servanthood, of laying your life down, of being that seed that goes into the ground and dies? That's where glory shows up in the kingdom. You guys don't get it. You're upside down. Does that make sense, guys? Are you getting what Jesus is saying here? You're either deep in thought or comatose. Because you're freaking me out. And every September we have to do this. Every September we have to relearn how to listen to sermons at CV. You're okay to talk. You're okay to shout. You're okay to respond. You're okay to ask questions. This isn't an audience. This is a family. Okay? And Jesus is rocking James and John's world. But they're clueless. We can, they answered. (laughs) And he's like, oy vey. And so Jesus goes, yeah, okay. You are going to suffer. You know, you read the book of Acts. James is hacked to death with swords. He's cut to bits. John outlives them all and dies in exile. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now, in verse 41, it says this. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant indignant with James and John. Why do you think they were? Why do you think they were? Has, have, yeah. Have any of you been in an office where someone gets in front of you for the promotion and curries the favor of the boss? Has any of you been in that situation, maybe a classroom, where you get in there and you know, that person kind of wiggles their way into the prime spot and you're not, oh, what a poor person. Oh, they just, they're consumers. They don't understand where life is found. I'm going to lay down my life here. You go, dang it. They beat me to it. Yeah? we all been there. we got that t-shirt. And that's what the rest of the disciples are thinking. James and John, how terrible that they would seek position. I wanted to seek it. Yeah? But they don't say it. They were indignant with James and John. And Jesus knows this. He gets this. And he calls them together. And he says that you know that those who are regarded as rulers, as important people, people who are given glory and honor in our culture, of the Gentiles, lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So positions of leadership are not positions of honor in the sense that you get privileges and that you get entitlement and that you get bonuses. He says this, no, leadership, whoever wants to become great, must be a servant. The life that is honored, the life that is blessed is the life of a servant. And that word literally means being a waiter. To run errands. Is that what the leader does in your workplace? Is that what the leader does in your school? Is that what a leader does in your family? And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. One who gives themselves up to another's best. And the origin of that word is to bind or fasten with chains. Servant, slave equals great. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve And to give his life as a ransom for many. (laughs) Kingdom greatness, which is the only real greatness, is by going low. The path to greatness is the low path. It's the descent into greatness. And the kingdom comes to us. And it says, this is our way. 
And consumerism comes to us and says, this is our way. And it asks you, where are you going to go? And for us, we need to realize that if we will not be intentional and we do not choose, we will end up with this weird mixture of the two that doesn't work because they're categorically opposite. And Jesus comes to you and he says, will you come on a journey to learn about true greatness? Will you come on a journey to learn about life with a capital L? Follow me. I want to teach you. Let me read you a couple stories and then we're going to close. One wet, miserable morning, Ray Blankenship was making breakfast when he looked out the window onto the open stormwater drain that ran alongside his house. What he saw terrified him. It was a small girl being swept down the drain. But he also knew that further downstream, the ditch disappeared with a roar underneath the road. Ray ran out the door and raced along the ditch, trying to get ahead of the little girl. Then he hurled himself into the deep, churning water. So it's like a little river where storm waters would be channeled into, okay? He surfaced and was able to grab the child's arm. They tumbled end over end within about one meter of the drain going under the road. Ray's free hand felt something protruding from the bank. He grabbed a hold and held on for dear life. If I could just hang on until help comes, he thought. But he did better than that. By the time the fire department rescuers arrived, Ray had pulled the girl to safety. Both were treated for shock. Ray Blankenship was awarded the U.S. Coast Guard's Silver Life-Saving Medal. The award is fitting. Ray was at even greater risk to himself than most people know. You see, Ray can't swim. In 1972, a two-year-old Chinese boy... Hu Jen Xuan fell from a table and went into a coma. When he woke up after six days, he was not able to talk or move. Like any parent, his mother was terribly distressed, yet her distress was multiplied by the fact that she could not afford to place him in a nursing home. Instead, she has cared for Hu Jen herself. And her care has shown the unfathomable depth of her mother love. You see, because he is unable to move, Hu Jen is liable to get terrible bed sores. So for the past 30 years, his mother has done the unbelievable. She has carried her son on her back. As of May 2002, Lu Kulan was 65 years old and weighed 40 kilograms. Her son, now a grown man, weighing 82 kilograms. On many occasions, Lou has fallen and fractured bones while carrying her son. Yet she continues to carry him. When asked how she can do it, her reply is simple. He isn't heavy. He's my son. Jesus is saying to you and me, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me all the way to the cross. And because I died on that cross first and then walked out of the grave, I have a life for you that I want to pour out in you to enable you to serve. And every time you step out to serve beyond your own ability and I give you the grace, you're going to experience life. Life with a capital L. Abundant life. And that if you chase life, try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But as you follow me on the path downward, giving your life away, you will find my life. My abundant life. And this is a journey we're on as a family. We're going to give these four talks that we've done this month.
to every new person that comes to Canterbury Vineyard from here on out. And we're just going to say, listen, this is the journey we're on. We want to learn how to lay our lives down. We want to walk the cross life that we might be genuinely alive. And that we might be able to be a part of Jesus changing people's lives around us. You and I are called to serve. To serve where Jesus prompts you everywhere you go. And not to look for a return. But to know that your Father will glorify you. Your Father will bless you. Your Father will honor you as you choose. Worship team, you want to come on up.